My topic today is uh, voting rights and the Constitution. And this is also, in part, a story about federalism. Justice Souter spoke here about the great range and breadth of language in the Constitution. Some language is very specific, and some terms, such as equal protection, are extraordinarily broad. He said the Constitution included a menu of approved values, the application of which has got to be worked out over time, where making these values work out in practice was an assignment left to the future. And of course, he included the Supreme Court in that process. Some rights are recognized in order to make practical sense of what the Constitution says or the values to protect, he added. Our capacity to see facts, or what one of my colleagues calls social facts, depends on what our experience has opened our eyes to, so this varies over time. Now, in the history of the United States, access to the franchise was a struggle. Voting was sometimes seen as a privilege to be earned, and universal suffrage was not the expectation or norm through a large part of our history. As some groups won the right to vote, um, when property and tax paying qualifications were dropped, for example, restrictions were sometimes simultaneously or subsequently added um, for other groups. Um, only in the past 50 or 55 years can we say that we have achieved something near universal suffrage in the United States. And even so, the story is complicated and the lines of responsibility between the states and the federal government are contested. Now, each state adopts its own rules and requirements for voting and conducting elections. The Constitution allows this. Um, Instead of stipulating nationwide requirements, it accepts the rules and requirements the states had at the time of the adoption of the Constitution for the selection of state legislators. And yes, I bolded particular phrases here. The electors of e in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. That's about the House of Representatives. And then for the Senate, and this was amended in uh, 1913 uh, after uh, there was direct election of senators, the electors of, in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. Um, now, states further decentralize the process and give election administration uh, uh, responsibilities to counties, cities, and township governments. Um, there are thousands of election rules and practices in the United States, not just 50 state election systems, but one person estimated something like 4,600 different sets of rules uh, were possible, and that's more than the number of counties in the United States. Um, so I, I emphasize here from Article 1, Section 4, and the part that I want to talk about right now is the Times places and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. I'll come back and talk to the other. Um, so for much of the nation's history, that meant that the following kinds of things varied by state. Voter registration rules and deadlines. Rules for how candidates get on the ballot. What kind of documents, if any, do you need to produce in order to vote? At certain times in the nation's history, if you were an immigrant, you had to bring sealed naturalization papers to the polling place. Um, Arizona's requirement for proof of citizenship is going to be heard by the Supreme Court this year. Ballot design. Palm Beach County, the famous butterfly ballot uh, that was so confusing in the 2000 election is, is a county design. Whether or not you can vote in a primary election. Are you registered as a Democrat or a Republican? In my state, independents cannot vote in primary elections, and I can't vote in a Republican primary if I'm registered as a Democrat, and vice versa. Um, are parties private organizations so that they can bar African Americans from participating? For a number of years, that was considered to be constitutional. Um, literacy tests, poll taxes, how voter rolls are maintained, purged, and your recourse, if any, if your name is not on that list. Um, access to absentee ballots, early voting. 
whether convicted felons can vote, whether students or graduate students attending college in the state can vote there. How long do you have to have lived in a state in order to vote? Some states in the 19th century, late 19th century, allowed immigrants to vote before they were citizens. And other states barred Native Americans from voting even when they were citizens. So in 1924, any Native American who had not already been declared a citizen was declared a citizen by federal law. But it wasn't until about 1950 that the final state was forced to stop disenfranchising Native Americans. So all of these things have historically varied. From 1965, let's see if I can go forward. Um, that's not what I want. Um, hold on just a second. From 1965, when the Voting Rights Act became law, until roughly 2002, 2003, the federal government played a very important role in expanding voting rights so that we could almost say in the United States we had universal suffrage. The government made sure that um, states and counties that had actively discriminated against those seeking to vote, African Americans and later uh, Latinos and some uh, language minorities, um, would not continue to do so. And that changes to voting laws and, uh, and to vote and electoral districting would not cause retrogression or dilution of minority voting. Um, in a subsequent reauthorization in um, 1970, certain counties and townships where registration or voting in the 1968 election was under 50% were included, and I believe that that's how come a couple of counties in New Hampshire are covered. Um, uh, you will have to tell me that history. Um, the Voting Rights Act also barred poll taxes and literacy tests in any federal, state, or local election for five years. The, uh, a 1964 constitutional amendment barred the use of the poll tax or any other tax um, in order to vote in a federal election. But in 1966, uh, the Justice Department goes after my home state of Virginia for using a poll tax in state elections. And in Harper versus the Board of Elections in 66, uh, the court declares unconstitutional poll taxes as a condition of voting in state elections. They declared it a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment by introducing a voter qualification that invidiously discriminates. I want to read you a little language from that decision because I think it relates to Justice Souter's perspective. Justice Douglas, writing for the court in Harper, said, um, the Equal Protection Clause is not shackled to the political theory of a particular era. In determining what lines are unconstitutionally discriminatory, we have never been confined to historical notions of equality. Notions of what constitutes equal treatment for purposes of the Equal Protection Clause do change. So the Harper decision, like the Voting Rights Act, treat the right to vote as a fundamental right. A precious right, the court says in Harper. And Harper again says, where fundamental rights and liberties are asserted under the Equal Protection Clause, classifications which might invade or restrain them must be closely scrutinized and carefully confined. So when the court talks about fundamental rights, we usually expect to see the court using strict scrutiny of laws that might violate that right, asking that the state have a compelling state interest for the restrictions they introduce. And we also, the court usually demands that the laws be narrowly tailored to achieve a, uh, and use the least restrictive means to accomplish its compelling state interest. Now, the Voting Rights Extension of, of 1975 permanently banned literacy tests. Um, now I will go back. Um, in addition, in this period, um, I mean, we've, we obviously, well, we've also added, let me see, I've got the slides in the wrong order. This, these, this is a map of sections of the United States and states covered um, under the preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act. 
Um, there are opportunities for bailout, but I just wanted you to see this map for a second. So in this rough period, roughly 1960, 1972, um, the district of member, uh, residents of the District of Columbia get to vote for president. Uh, it does say in such manner as Congress may direct, um, but that effectively meant that people got to vote for president and vice president. And then the uh, uh, poll tax is the 24th Amendment, and then the 26th Amendment of 1971 added the right to vote for 18-year-olds, extended the right to vote. So unlike some other periods in US history, beginning uh, around 1964, uh, there's, a there's a period of continuing affirmation and expansion of the right to vote. And good, I did do it right. Um, and this, too, is clearly authorized by the Constitution. That is, the same Article I, Section 4, where I highlighted the first part, now I look at the second part. But Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations except as to the places, places of choosing senators. So some of these things took a constitutional amendment, but extension of the right to vote through things like the Voting Rights Act was congressional legislation that uh, the court uh, 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 held, held uh, Congress had the right to do. So the court participated in this period in this process of affirmation. Um, in 1972, the, the court struck down, uh, using strict scrutiny, um, a resin residency requirements uh, that burdened the right to vote, saying 30 days is enough. In other words, you don't have to be a resident of a state for a year or two years or anything like that in order to vote in that state. The National Voter Registration Act, Motor Voter, in 1993, was another step toward making it easier to vote. Um, this was effective uh, in 1995 for most states. and. Um, basically made it easier to register to vote at various government offices, the Division of Motor Vehicles, and mail-in forms. Um, the federal courts upheld this act against legal challenges. And the most recent federal effort, the Help America Vote Act, was passed in 2002 after the mess of the 2000 election. Um, the federal government offers states money to update and improve voting equipment and required that there be voting equipment of accessible to persons with disabilities uh, at each polling place and mandated that states maintain state-wide computerized lists of registered voters that could be verified for accuracy and updated regularly. HAVA also required for the first time uh, uh, some kind of voter ID system. That is, people registering to vote uh, for the first time uh, had to have some kind of identification with their name and address on it, but many kinds of documents were allowed to satisfy that. But that's the first federalization of any kind of a voter ID uh, requirement. Now, the most important exception to universal suffrage was that most states disenfranchised incarcerated felons. Many states did so during the, peri the period of probation, and a few states disenfranchised convicted felons for life. But even here, there were processes of liberalization in the states during this period of time leading up to around 2002, 2003. So in the United States, let me close this a second, many ballots are spoiled wasted and not counted due to election equipment malfunction and possible tampering. Errors, signatures that don't seem to match records on file, confusing instructions, difficulty determining voter intentions. We can't simply blame voter ignorance or neglect because a lot of these forms that people use are very confusing. Now, in 2004, election observers from the Vienna-based Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe came to the U.S. for the first time. Um, they usually observe elections in developing uh, countries. Uh, but they came to the United States, and observers in Florida reported that they had less access to the polls than in Kazakhstan, 
that the electronic voting, and I was in Kazakhstan during the 2008 election, <laughs> that the electronic voting had fewer fail-safes than in Venezuela, that the ballots were not so simple as in the Republic of Georgia, and that no other country had such a complex um, ele national election system. So this complexity is one of the prices we pay for federalism, but uh, there's a lot, there, is, there are things that the federal government could do. Again, I put up the slide. Uh, to make the right to vote more uniform through the states. Um, ballots for federal elections could be standardized. Rules for counting, rejecting, recounting ballots could also be standardized. Um, equipment could have been standardized, but that isn't what the federal government chose to do. They let states pick their own uh, equipment. Um, but there's a bigger hurdle, because despite this, there is no federal constitutional right to vote. So we have the clause, Article 2, Section 1, each, each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. I'll go, go on with, the, with that. Um, since uh, by 1832, most states allowed popular election of the electors. South Carolina was the last state to do so in, uh, I think, 1868, just after the Civil War. Um, but in Bush v. Gore, uh, the majority of the court made the following claim. The individual citizen has no federal constitutional right to vote for electors for the President of the United States unless and until the state legislature chooses a statewide election as a means to implement its power to appoint members to the Electoral College. So what states gave, they could take away. If the state of New Hampshire decided that they were going to appoint electors in another manner, they could, and you wouldn't have any right to vote for President or Vice President of the United States. So it was a big surprise to many Americans to hear that, but it is indeed true that the Constitution doesn't guarantee that right. Um, one such amendment was introduced in Congress a couple of years after the 2000 election, um, and in many nations, the right to vote uh, 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 is clearly established, but, but it is not in our Constitution. So in my state of Pennsylvania, the challenge to the new voter identification law was made under state law, which actually has a more robust protection of the right to vote than does the federal Constitution. So after 2002-2003, there was a political reaction, a tightening of ballot access. Um, probably fueled by close elections and the influx of new voters into the system that tended to favor one party over the other. The Supreme Court upheld the Indiana law uh, adding voter uh, ID, uh, photo voter ID requirement in time for it to go into effect for the 2008 election. And that gives states wide berth to implement laws uh, designed to maintain the integrity of the election process, prevent voter fraud, and promote confidence through elections. Now, most court scholars saw this case as a significant departure from what we thought the court was saying about the fundamentalness of the right to vote. Because, remember, if voting is a fundamental right, then a state should have to show or demonstrate a compelling state interest in the restrictions that they Posed. And, they, and they claimed that the burdens on the voters were undue instead of saying that, instead of using the usual standard you use in a strict scrutiny test. So um, normally a state can't try to correct hypoth hypothetical problems. Um, and, and nonetheless, lots of states after the Crawford versus Marion County decision in 2008 began to implement um, voter ID rules. Um, so um, that's one kind of res uh, restriction. And then recently, um, I just want to say a word about um, uh, attempts to end certain provisions of the Voting Rights Act, especially Section 5. Um, the Voting Act's, uh, Rights Act was reauthorized in 2006 uh, for 25 years. Um, and in the, the reauthorization of the act, there were no changes to the list of states covered. Um, uh, under the original act. Congress did conduct hearings, they heard from expert witnesses, and collected a lot of testimony about the continuing need for the Voting Rights Act. The, um, 
Court has been increasingly concerned, however, with what they see as the federalism costs of this preclearance requirement. Um, the court has, in the same period of time, also turned away from race, explicit recognition of race, as you heard this morning, for purposes of remedying past discrimination. They're concerned with how long is their oversight, how long should oversight go on? Should the Justice Department still be supervising uh, uh, redistricting in covered states for fear of dilution of minority votes? Um, after all, partisan gerrymandering is generally considered acceptable. Um, the 2008 election of Barack Obama led some critics to argue that conditions had radically changed. Um, whites do not vote as a block to keep African American candidates from voting, from selecting the candidate of their choice. Um, but what people are also concerned about is that the long lines and um, election equipment malfunction, uh, the sometimes deliberate uh, short changing of urban uh, precincts uh, with, with voting machines that chronically break down or not enough equipment. Um, it happens in Ohio, not just Texas. In other words, it happens in jurisdictions that aren't covered by the Voting Rights Act. So why should Ohio be treated differently than Texas, for example? So the reauthorization dodge of the Voting Rights Act and Section 5 preclearance dodged a major bullet uh, in 2009 where the court on a very narrow technicality did not reach the preclearance issue. However, the court has been narrowing its reading of Congress's remedial powers under the 14th and 15th Amendment uh, recently, and now the court has agreed to hear a new voting rights case from Shelby County, Alabama, this year, um, and it is a challenge to Section 5. Many people think that Section 5 will go down. Um, it's interesting the court says they, and not Congress, gets to decide what equal protection means. In other words, the con that Congress does not get a chance to weigh in on what equal protection means. And I have a number of colleagues who think that this is a rather dramatic statement by the court about judicial supremacy, whereas they thought John Marshall and many other proponents of judicial review had taken a more measured approach to whether branches got to interpret the Constitution for themselves. So, Justice Souter said that the court's capacity to see facts depends on what our experience has opened our eyes to, and that this was a way the principled Constitution decision-making works. Um, but there are a number of approved values in the Constitution. The movement of constitutional change is not simply linear. And so it seems that the, the way of evaluating these competing constitutional values, such as equal protection and federalism is shifting, and voting and voting rights under the Constitution stand to be affected. Thank you.